Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 231. So in this video, we are finishing up our discussion of some pretty fundamental uh, programming stuff by talking about loops. So loops are really just a fantastic way for us to repeat code multiple times, uh, possibly uh, introducing different values as we go along. So a loop in MATLAB fundamentally takes the form of what I have sort of outlined in blue right here. So what it is, is we say for k equals some sort of colon notation. So this is something that you're familiar with. It might be something like, I don't know, if you want k to be every uh, integer from negative 3 to 3, you could say k equals 3, uh, sorry, negative 3, colon 1, colon 3. Which remember, this says then that k equals the array negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Like that. So what we're saying is for every value in this array, we're going to run this code assuming that k equals a specific value in here. And then we end the uh, loop and continue on with the rest of the code. So what's going on in here is that this loop is going to uh, run the number of times as there are elements in this vector right there. And the first run, k is going to be the first element in our vector. So in this case, if our example is k equals negative 3, 1, 3, k will start out as negative 3. It'll run the code where k equals negative 3. Then in the next run, k will then become negative 2. In the next run, k will then become negative 1, and then 0 and then one, and then two, and then three. And as you can see here, what I've done is I've sort of rewritten this code as if the loop wasn't there. So this is what the code would look like if we were to individually run, uh, if we were to individually write out each run of our loop. So we could say uppercase K equals uh, the vector from starting at F, uh, incrementing by S and ending at T. So for our example right here, we're saying, uh, negative 3 colon 1 colon 3 or something like that. Then we start out with k equals the first element of uppercase k, which in this case k equals 3. Then we run the code where, with uh, k being equal to 3. Then we set k, oh sorry, this should actually be negative 3. Then we set k to the second element of uppercase k, so then k becomes negative 2. We run through the code again. Then we set k equal to negative 1, run through the code, set k equal to 0, run through the code, etc., 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 until finally we set k equal to the last element of our uppercase k, which in this case is 3. We run through the code, and then we, we hit the end of the for loop, so then we just run all the code that comes after the for loop. So what I have is I have an example of code in MATLAB that I'm going to show you in just a sec. All right, so this code is some MATLAB code that uses a loop in order to print the first 10 perfect squares. So what I mean by perfect squares is a number where the, that is basically an integer where the square root of that integer is equal to another integer. So for example, one, because the square root of one is one, four is a perfect square because the square root of four is two, uh, nine is a perfect square because the square root of nine is three, and so on and so on. So what I have is I'm basically using this loop in order to simplify the amount of code that I need to write in order to print the ten, first 10 positive squares. So what we have right here is that k is going to iterate over all values from 1 to 10. So it'll be k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, and so on and so forth. And what I'll do at every step is I will print out the value of k squared. So the first thing I'll print is 1, then the second thing I'll print is 2 squared, which is 4, then the third thing I'll print is 9, then 16, then 25, and so on and so on. So let's take a look at what this code looks like, and as you can see in the command window, it successfully prints everything. Now, the nice thing about using loops like this is it's really easy to change just change things up. So now let's say I want to print the first 20 perfect squares. I can, all I have to do is change this 10 to a 20. 
And look at this. Now it just runs 10 more times. Maybe I want to print uh, all of the odd perfect squares from 1 to 20. And look at that. Now we have all of the odd perfect squares from 1 to 20. That is, so it works out really nicely. So for loops are really powerful ways of letting us, rather than us having to repeat code over and over and over again, uh, it lets us consolidate our code into defining our actions based on the value of k as k iterates over a certain range. So honestly, uh, for loops are super powerful tools, and they're going to be worth uh, worth looking a lot into as we uh, keep on as we keep on talking about MATLAB stuff. So now. What happens if we put a for loop instead of a for loop? Well, this is what my next example is all about here. So what this is, um, just for some context, uh, just I guess for some background, in lab 10, we spent a lot of time talking about this mesh grid function. And what the mesh grid function is, is it basically takes a vector of x values and a vector of y values, and then it creates every single ordered pair of all x and y values, uh, sorry, of all possible x and y values. So what I have right here is I have some code that what the, what it's meant to do is it's meant to basically print out the output of mesh grid, but actually formatted as points. So for clarification right here, if this would be the same thing as taking um, yeah, x from uh, let me actually put this in common. So if we did x uh, equals negative 2 to 10, y equals 1, 5, 30, and then we did something like x, y equals mesh, ah, mesh grid, x, y, something like this, then the values in x and y, if we sort of take the values of x and y together, we, we get all of these ordered points. And what I'm doing here is basically just taking all those values and you can think of it as I'm taking all these values and printing them using these for loops. So what I want to do before I run through the code is I want to actually go through manually and take a look at the order that everything goes in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to the document camera and uh, we'll take a look at just running through everything. So what I recommend you do is write down the code for this. I'll, you know, I'll write down the code as well. But um, we're going to take a look manually, take a look at every value of x and y, and just see how the whole program runs. OK, so I have the code for the function that we just, or sorry, for the script that we just looked at all written down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace through the entire, or not the entire, but a good part of the iteration, I guess running all of this MATLAB code. And we'll see sort of what happens as we do that. So. First, what we do is we're running this as a normal for loop. So we say uh, if x is equal to all values, uh, and let's say that, let me actually write out what this will be. So this will be negative 2, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. This one right here will be 1, 6, uh, 11, 16, 21, 26. So what we do is in this for loop, we first say, OK, x is going to be equal to negative 2. Then we enter this next for loop. We say, OK, now y is going to, at this point here, we set y equal to 1. And then we say, OK, we are printing the x value and the y value. So this will be negative 2, 1, and then a space after it. Then we come to the end of this for loop and say, OK, well, there are still more values of y to go through in here. So we go back up here, and now we set y equal to 6. And notice that we don't change x at all. The only time we change x is once we reach this end and then come back up to the top once we realize there's more uh, values for us to go through. So for the moment, we're still leaving x as negative 2. But we, iter we change y to then become 6. So then we will print the value of x and y as an ordered pair. So this becomes negative 2, 6. And then we come to this end. We say, OK, there are still values of y left for us to explore. So we'll come back up here. We'll come back up here, change y to the next element, which is 11. And then we'll print out the value here. So this becomes negative 2, 11. 
come to the end, go back up. So that part repeats over and over again. So let's see, I'm going to uh, speed this part up a little bit. So we'll do, now y goes to 16, so this becomes negative 2, 16. Then y goes to 21, this becomes negative 2, 21. Then y goes to 26, and we print out negative 2, 26 right here. Now, what happens is we come to the end and we say, okay, well, y has gone through all of these. y is currently 26, and there's nothing left for y to do. So now we leave this for loop and come down here to this f print f, which says print a new line. So now we just go down to the next line here, like this. We come to this end and we say, okay, well, x was negative 2, and there are still elements for x that x can be. So now we'll come back up here and set x equal to 0. So now at x equals 0, we come back down to this for loop and say, oh, time to start a new for loop. So y is going to be the first element of this, and we set y equal to 1. And the cycle repeats. So then our output, when x equals 0, will be 0, 1 space, 0, 6, space, 0, 11, space, 0, 16, space, 0, 21, space, 0, 26, space. We come to the end of y's for loop, we print our new line, we come to the end of x's for loop, we say, okay, well now x needs to go from 0 to 2, and we repeat that over and over and over again. So what we end up with is in total, we get all of the possible combinations of x values and y values as expressed in ordered pairs. So let's take a look at what that looks like in MATLAB. And if we run this, let me uh, clear and CLC really quick. Oh. CLC, there we go. If you run this, you'll see that we get every row has a new value for x. And the reason why is because I put this f print f after y's uh, I put this f print f after y's uh, for loop, and in this, every column it has a new value for y because for every value of x I then iterate over every possible value of y. So that's what happens when you nest a for loop is that it basically handles this inside for loop completely before it then goes on to the next iteration of our outside for loop. And this basically you can nest as many for loops as you can feasibly type. With, or as, you know, obviously there's some restrictions on how much code MATLAB can run at once, but that restriction is pretty large. So the, really the big barrier here, here is however many for loops you can type, you can nest inside of each other, and the innermost for loop gets resolved, and then the next inner, and then the next for loop gets re resolved, and then the next one, and so on and so on. So what we have, again, just to sum up, is that x becomes its first value, then we take care of y's for loop completely, x becomes its second value, we take care of y's for loop completely, x becomes its third value, we take care of y's completely, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's the basics of nesting for loops is what we call this, when we have a for loop nested inside of another for loop. All right, so the last thing we really need to talk about for loops is how to stop loops prematurely. And there's a couple of commands that we can actually talk about for stopping for loops prematurely. The first is break, which if you type, if you run a break command when you're inside of a certain for loop, you completely leave your for loop. You skip all remaining iterations and you basically pop out to the type, to the piece of code after the end. So if we, um, yeah, basically you, you just pop out of your for loop completely and then move on to everything after the end. However, Note that if you type a break, if you're in a nested for loop, so let's take a look at that actually. So let's say for something, right? We're gonna have some code here. We'll type in for something else. Let's say we have some code, something else, and other code down here, and then end like this. Uh, sorry, this should actually say break. Okay, so let's follow the path that this code takes as we come down here. So we're going to enter this first for loop, and then we enter the second for loop, right? We 
we do all of this code and then we hit our break statement like this. And at this point, we completely exit our for loop. We do not continue to the next iteration. We do not run any of this code. We immediately jump out here and run through this code down here. And now, once we hit this end, we say, okay, well, now we're going to come back up to this for loop here, run through here, come back into the for loop, run through, hit the break, and we say, okay, well, time to come back out here, run all this code after our inner for loop, and then repeat that over and over and over again. So you might be wondering, well, why do we really care? Like, if we have a break in here, obviously this is going to skip out all the all of the possible iterations. So why do we even care about having a break? Why, why even have an inner for loop? And that's honestly a good point, which is why you'll usually see break statements nested inside of if statements. So break is often a really good way of like preventing things from going wrong. So for example, let's say you're doing a whole bunch of calculations inside of a for loop, and then you have an if statement that checks, well, do we have an invalid input? And if you, if that, input is, or maybe not input, but like it, it, you have an invalid value somewhere. So if that break does show up, or sorry, if that invalid value does show up, then you'll completely just get out of the for loop for the rest of that. Words. What you want to do is you want to break out of that inner for loop and then continue on. So I'll show you an example of that in a hot second. But the other type of uh, stopping uh, for loops prematurely that we have is continue, which basically once you see a continue, all it does is it just skips the rest of the code for this current iteration and then moves on to the next iteration of the current for loop. So if instead of this example, we have something like for something with a bunch of code down here and then another for something with more code, continue, more code here, and code and like this. What you would end up doing is you come into the for loop, you do all this code, come into this for loop, you do all this code, you hit the continue, and rather than doing all of this, you continue on to the next iteration. So you pop back up here, set your uh, variable to be the next value, come down here, hit the continue, pop back up here, set the variable to be the next value, and you keep on doing that over and over and over again until you hit the end and then come down here. So again, uh, continue also often works in the similar way to break that. It's a good way of if you detect something might go wrong, then you can hit continue and uh, just move on to the next uh, iteration. So let's see a couple examples in action. Okay, so the code that I have right here, basically it prints all values of x divided by y for all x and y between negative three and three. So what we're doing is we're iterating over all x and then iterating over all y so that x and y take on all integers between negative three and three inclusive. And then we just print x divided by y and then print a new line after we finish every uh, iteration of y. So. If you are eagle-eyed, you might spot a mistake, but let me uh, run the program just to make sure. And you'll notice we have all this negative infinity, this not a number, and this infinity stuff right here, right? These are where y equals zero. And when y equals zero, we have some division by zero errors, which is bad. So let's do our best to remedy this. Let's say that um, if y equals zero, we don't want to print anything. Or actually, even better, let's say if y equals 0, uh, what we want to do is we want to print some sort of error. Let, let's say we want to print division by 0. So f print f division by 0, like that. And then, of course, we don't want to actually do the division by 0 because dividing by 0 is really bad. I've heard it might, uh, I don't know, destroy the universe or something like that. So rather than continuing on with this loop, we'll hit break. And um, actually, no, what we'll do is we'll hit continue. My bad. We'll hit continue, and then we'll skip on to the next value of y. So let's see what happens here. And you'll see our division by zero error. 
and then it just continues. So it doesn't actually calculate this x divided by y when uh, y is equal to zero, which is fantastic. Uh, another thing we can do is let's say um, if we encounter a possible division by zero, let's say that we just want to stop the program completely because maybe we're taking in some lower and upper bounds from the user. And if there's a division by zero, we want to alert the user, hey, something bad has happened. I'm not going to continue on with your code because you need to check your inputs. Something else might be wrong. So if we did break instead, you'll see right here that the division stops when y equals zero rather than continuing with y equals one, y equals two, y equals three, and so on. So that's the difference between using continue and break is that continue continues on with the rest of the uh, iterations of our inner loop and break continues on with the uh, rest of our, or sorry, break stops the rest of the iterations of our inner loop. So now let's try another way of handling this. Let's say instead we want to do, um, oh, give me a second. Let's say we want to do y divided by x instead of x divided by y, which means that what we need to do here is we need to do our uh, checking for division by zero code before we go into the y uh, for loop. So we'll do something like if x equals equals zero and, and let's say we want to do basically the same thing where we, if we see that x is, um, if we see that x is going to be zero, we just say division by zero and then move on to the next thing. So we don't want to stop it abruptly. We want to continue. So we'll say f print f uh, division by zero. And then we actually want to put a new line here because remember, if we hit continue at this point, then none of this stuff, including this new line right here, is going to be printed. And then we'll hit continue. And what the result of this is, let me uh, clear everything first and then uh, run the script, is that the result of this is that once we hit x equals zero, nothing gets calculated because then we would have division by zero error. So we come here, we see that there's a division by zero, we print our error, and then it says continue, which says, okay, now let's move on to x equals one, which shows everything that's going on here. If we do break instead, then what happens is you we just stop completely. So x equals one, x equals two, x equals three, None of that happens. And then the nice thing is that let's say now we do, uh, let's, let's say we do some bounds where zero isn't included at all. Let's say uh, one to 10. Well, notice we have no division by zero errors. So then the entirety of our for loops, of our nested for loops here, they, com they run completely just perfectly. So yeah, basically, this is break and continue are really nice ways, especially of, I, I would say their most useful cases are when you're error checking and you want to uh, stop a loop part of the way through. That's not to say that those are the only cases, but break and continue are really easy, are really fantastic for if you want, if you know, you come across something unexpected and you need to stop your loop completely. So that's our discussion of loops in MATLAB. I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, have a nice day.